use to talk about the presentation. Okay. All right. Can someone tell are we online? Yes? No? Can someone check? Let's see if we're sending. Do we have audio? <coughs> Does anybody here work with FPGAs anyway? Besides, use them, barely. with them, yeah. barely. <laughs> no, I work with Peter Wallace's. Ah, uh, so you use them, but you don't. You probably don't play with them too much. No designing. Uh, okay, all right, so we're good. Um, my name is Charles Steinkuller. I've been uh, working with Machine Kit for quite a long time. Working with FPGAs for much longer than that. And I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've done with the SOC plus FPGA systems. Um, I use Altera parts. They're also uh, parts from Xilinx. And uh, we're going to just go over briefly like what to do if you just want to use one of the things. And then uh, all the pieces that go into putting a working system together and how to uh, tweak some of those pieces if you want something changed, uh, or if you just want to be able to rebuild the pieces from scratch and not rely on something someone else has made. <clears throat> so the easiest way to use these, like a lot of the things with the small arm uh, boards, is to just grab an image that somebody else has made. Uh, so there are a variety of development kits available uh, that'll get you hardware to get going. Um, Terasic, uh, Digilent, uh, Mir, Zboards. Um, these have different SOC parts on them from Altera or Xilinx. Uh, they have different features. Some of them will have video in and out. Some of them will have uh, uh, different kinds of I.O. Uh, I've worked mostly with the Terasic DE0 Nano SOC, which is quite a bit to say, but there is actually a DE0 Nano which is not an SOC, so uh, it's required to be uh, complete. Uh, I, I like that, that board because it has a, a two sets of standard 10th inch pin headers, which makes it very easy to make adapter boards for um, and play with. A lot of the others either do not have much in the way of IO expansion or have very small uh, service mount special purpose headers that you have to basically build a, a printed circuit board to be able to talk to effectively. So you can get yourself one of these uh, development boards. Uh, the three listed there are ones we have uh, images created for. Um, the images are found um, on Michael Haberler's server. Uh, you can just download the, it's a standard OS image, um, complete micro SD card image. You burn it to a micro SD card, just as you would for a BeagleBone or a Raspberry Pi or any of the other ARM systems that take a micro SD cord, you boot it up and uh, away you go. Um, now, of course, it's not entirely that simple. A lot of these boards do not have um, everything really set up the way that you would for uh, like a Raspberry Pi. You can just plug the micro SD card in or a BeagleBone and, and away it goes. Um, most of these dev kits do not have an EEPROM on them, so they don't have things like an Ethernet, IP, uh, physical Ethernet address. You have to assign that typically in the U-boot bootloader with a serial console. Um, they also uh, typically support a very large number of boot options, and it may or may not be selected to boot from the micro SD card when you get it out of the box. So you may have to play with some configuration switches and some other things. There is a detailed uh, getting started guide for the DE0 Nano SoC, uh, which is linked in the references section. and. Um, in general, the documentation that comes with the boards would, would help you get going there. Uh, but basically, you, you just plug the SD card in and, and away you go, by and large. Uh, now, these are quite literally entire computer systems, which means there's quite a lot of moving parts and pieces if you want to rebuild everything from the ground up. Um, besides the actual physical hardware of the board that you're running on, um, the first thing that <coughs> gets uh, comes into play is, is the bootloader, and that is typically U-boot, uh, which is the same as would be used on most any of the ARM systems and various other um, systems. Uh, then U-boot bootstraps the Linux kernel. Uh, the Linux kernel then boots into a root uh, file system. 
We typically use Debian, uh, but uh, you can use any Linux file system that you like. Uh, you also then uh, run your particular application. Here, that would be Machine Kit. And uh, then there's also the hardware, sort of the soft hardware, which is the FPGA uh, bitstream that would get loaded into the FPGA fabric. And the uh, actual interface hardware, which uh, may or may not be on the board that you have. Uh, if you design your own board, you'd probably put the stepper drivers and whatever you need to talk to them on that board. Uh, if you're using one of the development kits, you need an interface to whatever it is that you're using to drive your motors or listen to encoders or, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> to customize these various pieces, uh, most of the software is pretty straightforward. Uh, with U-Boot and Linux and the uh, actual OS itself, um, if you are using recent versions of U-Boot and the Linux kernel, which I would highly suggest, the FPGA support has been very dynamic, but is pretty much settled out now. When you get past the 4.4 uh, series Linux kernel, it's all generally been mainlined. So you can use um, mainline U-Boot, mainline kernel source, and build your own. Uh, both Xilinx and Altera also maintain their own Git repositories where they have various um, tagged and maintained, somewhat maintained um, vendor branches. So uh, you can go and check out. Typically, if you're looking at the vendor instructions for how to build a system, uh, they will tell you, go to our Git repository, check out this tag for this particular um, U-boot or kernel, and uh, they go through the process and all the things. They'll have a, an entire tool chain that's kind of expecting particular versions. Um, and that's helpful if you want to use that. Uh, you can certainly go off and uh, build your own, uh, at which point you may have to you know, keep an eye out for security back ports and things like that. Um, and then the OS is very, uh, <laughs> there's a million different ways you can go there from uh, Ubuntu or a standard Debian uh, root file system to Lenario or uh, Angstrom or you know whatever you want to uh, uh, use, however much you want to roll your own. Um, and then finally, the application machine kit. Uh, you can build that from source if you'd like uh, or just install from packages. They both have their uh, pros and cons. Um, it's easier to change if you install from source if you want to customize something. Um, if you're not really tweaking machine kit, I'd probably just say uh, install it from packages, um, assuming you're using Debian or something where you where you can install it uh, and not Angstrom where you'd have to build it from source. So if you want to tweak something, there's several different layers past the software that, uh, that you can tweak. Um, in general, uh, let me just take a little bit of a moment and describe somewhat the FPGA configuration. Essentially what we have done is the SOC plus FPGAs, it's, an, it's a single board system on a chip, which is the SOC part. There's an ARM, there's a memory controller, there's serial ports, uh, a micro SD card controller, all that sort of thing. Uh, so it's the system on chip part, but it is glued to an FPGA, which is a field programmable gate array. And uh, uh, for those who are familiar, uh, the MesaNet hardware, uh, 5i25s, uh, that sort of thing, those are FPGA cards that plug into a, a regular computer system. Uh, this is essentially the same thing as a computer system plus a Mesa card. It just all happens to be inside the same single physical chip. Um, but beyond that, um, there's a lot of similarities in terms of if you go buy a 5i25, it will come programmed with a particular bit file in the FPGA, and it'll do uh, it'll have a certain number of step direction uh, generators and general purpose I/O pins and encoder inputs and things like that. Uh, you can, however, connect various daughter cards. <clears throat> there are DB25 daughter cards. There are 50-pin daughter cards. It depends on which particular Mesa card you have. And these all have and support different numbers of smart serial channels, encoders, PWM generators, that sort of thing. So the FPGA source code, um, 
we have for all of the Mesa cards and that we're using for uh, this project is uh, all basically the same. It's it's the same. Uh, it, it, all the all the Mesa cards are uh, compiled from uh, the, essentially the same source tree. What changes is there are things that configure how uh, you know, which specific hardware is instantiated and how it's all connected. So uh, that's definable. Uh, so if you, for instance, take a 5i25 out of the box, plug it in, it'll work pretty well if you plug it to a generic uh, DB25 parallel port breakout card you might have for your stepper motor driver from uh, that you bought from China or whatever. Uh, if, however, you want to hook it to a 7i85 or 7i76 or one of the DB25 dollar cards, you may have to program a different bit file into the FPGA so that you have all the right pieces in the FPGA uh, to talk to the hardware you have connected. It's the same way here. Um, and just like, the, uh, just like the bit file you would use from Mesa would depend on which particular Mesa card you have and which particular daughter cards you're trying to hook it to, um, the same applies here. So uh, first of all, naming conventions. Um, uh, we're trying to, to sort of sort things out and have a consistent naming convention where the uh, project and the directory, the configuration directories are named after the specific platform. And the platform would include uh, both the base board design, uh, for instance, DE0 Nano SOC in this instance, and that's a dev kit board you can just buy. They're $100. You can, uh, you can get it, in, and it just has 10th um, inch uh, pin headers on it. And then uh, also part of the platform would be any I.O. adapter that you have that would hook it to other hardware. For instance, uh, you cannot dir connect, directly connect the uh, DE0 Nano to uh, Mesa uh, daughter cards. There's no appropriate connector, but I, I made an interface board that will connect DB25 boards to it. Um, you could also build a different connect, uh, interface board that would hook, the, uh, say, the 50 pin daughter cards up to it. So that's the platform, basically, like which um, that would sort of be the equivalent of uh, like a 5i25 or a 6i25 or something like that uh, from the Mesa world. And then uh, pin files uh, are named after the daughter cards that connect to, uh, that are supported with that particular bitstream. So uh, as I mentioned, the actual host mode 2 VHDL code um, is extremely flexible. Uh, it's the same source tree that generates all the different uh, permutations of the uh, uh, Mesa bit files and the bit files here. Uh, so you specify at compile time sort of exactly what you want to be building. Um, and you do that by passing uh, generics, which is a VHDL construct, uh, to the uh, host mode 2 instance. Um, and uh, basically there's a, a pins uh, file, that, well, there's a card ID, um, uh, which includes things like clock rates and the name of the board. And then there's a... Uh, a pin package file which says things like how many uh, step direction generators you have, how many PWM generators you have, how many encoder instances you have, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> this is all specified at build time and you can tweak those and change what gets uh, placed into the physical FPGA. So. Uh, When you want to act, if you want to actually change something, um, you can. Uh, the sim simple versions are fairly straightforward. Um, although I would say anyone who's listening to this or is watching, or any of you in here, uh, if you want to hook a different set of daughter cards up to one of the uh, D zero nano uh, or one of the existing um, configurations we, we we have already supported. Easiest thing to do would probably just be to uh, email the mailing list and somebody can probably do it for you. That would be me or that would be, uh, um, oh God, blank guy's name, um, the gentleman who does the Xilinx stuff. But either of us could do uh, either one. Uh, and you'll fact, in fact, you'll see on the Linux CNC list a lot of times somebody asking for like, hey, I need a like configuration file to support this combination of something. And it's not something that Peter has built before, and he's like, oh yeah, here, I'll make you that, and he makes it, and it's, it's not really a big deal. Um, sadly, there are not yet 
automated tools to do that. But if you know what you're doing, it's really not all that hard. It takes a couple of minutes and it's not a big deal. But what you do uh, have to do is you look in the um, configuration directory for your particular uh, board. And so uh, starting from the top level, there's a hardware directory and then an HM2 directory, which contains all the host mode 2 files. Um, and then, oh, I think I actually missed one. There's a config directory and then the project directory. So uh, there would be a config and then a, uh, a DE0 nano uh, SOC DB25 uh, directory that would have pin packages uh, or pin files and a uh, card file in it. And if you look in the pin files, um, you will see a module ID structure which controls uh, how many and what specific types of uh, modules, and that, that's your step direction generators, PWMs, that sort of thing, that would be module. Uh, it'll list a type of the module type and how many of them, and then a revision of them. Um, there's a few other details in there, like what clock source is used to drive it, things like that. And then um, after that, there's an array of pin definitions, and that specifies which uh, module special functions, like encoder, encoder channel zero, you know, signal A, signal B, signal Z is hooked to which particular pin on the FPGA. Um, these are pretty, these aren't really all that complicated. It'd be hard to come up with one from scratch, but they're very easy to modify if you just look at one of the ones that's already there. And almost universally, if you're going to be looking at this, you're probably going to be wanting to like, oh, I want one of these with a 70, 7i76 and like this other thing that nobody's supported yet. But if you look on the Mesa website, they have, there's literally hundreds of these for all the different flavors of cards that he's got. So um, you can pretty easily pull examples out of their zip packages um, and use those very, very much cut and paste. Um, however, like I said, there are no automated tools for generating these at the moment. Uh, so the user is kind of responsible for making sure things are correct and consistent, which um, isn't too big of a hassle, but it's, uh, you have to kind of know a little bit about HDL and understand a bit about what you're doing. So uh, other ways that you might want to configure, tweak the system is uh, the actual interface hardware. Right now, the only thing that is supported is currently the uh, DB25 uh, board for the DE0 Nano SOC. And uh, I got a link there to the design. That's a design I have done. Um, also in that GitHub repository, I'm about halfway through a version that has 50 pin headers on it. Uh, there's a, that's sort of the other flavor of uh, interconnect used by the Mesa daughter cards. Um, so you also, there's certainly nothing that says that you have to support Mesa daughter cards. Uh, you could very easily craft a, uh, an IO card that had step, uh, stepper drivers directly on it. Um, or perhaps, uh, uh, you know, three-phase BLDC driver, just physically on the board, you know, it's, it's whatever that you, you would like to do. Um, so uh, certainly anyone who's capable of doing a schematic and PC board layout, uh, this would be uh, very similar to anything else you would do. You just hook, hook the things that you need up to the pins that are available on the uh, uh, particular dot development kit board you're working with or put the entire system um, onto a board with the uh, BGA and the SDRAM and all that stuff anyway. Although then you're getting into a relatively complicated uh, board layout project. But uh, if you're doing a new platform, um, that would be either taking the, the SOC itself and crafting a whole new board or uh, like, hey, I'd really like to use this new maybe the ARIA 10 uh, dev kit that came out. And I want to uh, uh, craft a FPGA configuration for that so that I can use it. Um, in fact, the Terasic people have a, a ARIA 10 version of the Cyclone 5 DE0 Nano that I've been using. So you might want to use that. It's got a faster, it's got faster arm process on it, more FPGA gates. Um, it actually has the same pinout, so you could use my DB25 daughter card with it. Uh, so if you wanted to do that, the first thing to do is obtain details um, 
about the development kit, which you'll know if you design the board from scratch, or uh, you can find in their reference manuals if not. Um, things like clock frequencies, which BGA pins are hooked to which uh, IO uh, connector pins, that sort of thing. Um, you create a new card package that describes that. In general, the main things you want to change in there would probably be the clock frequencies, and uh, there are a couple of four character fields for the uh, board manufacturer and the ID and the board name. So you'd probably at least want to tweak those. You may or may not need to tweak anything else, but probably not. Um, then a pin package, again, that, dis that defines what modules you would like instantiated and how they're connected to the IO pins. Um, and there are different levels of GPIO pins. So uh, essentially the host mode two instance sees an array of IO pins and then the top level design that you create, which is a per platform basically, uh, connects those IO pins with the physical IO pins on the uh, FPGA package. And then those are connected by the board to specific uh, pin headers on the IO, uh, on the on the physical board that you would then connect to uh, your your hardware. Uh, so once you've once you've done this, you create a new project either for Cordis or Vivado. There are two separate directories. The Cordis is the Altera um, based products, and Vivado is the Xilinx design tool for the the Zinc. Um, and you may or may not. Uh, well, the easiest way to do that is to basically copy one of the existing designs and change the, the pinout and things if, if needed. Um, and you may or may not need to update the uh, HPS, uh, that's the hard processor system if you're Altera, or the PS, which is processor system if you're uh, Zinc, um, uh, using the particular uh, FPGA toolchain. That is essentially where you uh, define what IO of the, you know, which IO of the processor is supported, which is not used, which is GPIO pins, which are used by the FPGA. That's going to be dictated by your um, uh, board layout. That's something you would have to do if you created your own design from scratch. If you didn't, uh, you would probably just use the example design from the, uh, like if you're using one of the dev kits like the Terrasic board, they will have a uh, some example projects and all of that stuff will have been done for you and you can just copy it. So, uh, <clears throat> One of the hardest things really to do um, if you're getting started with this is uh, climbing the learning curve on how do I build all of these different pieces? Because there really are quite a lot of different pieces. There's the FPGA bit file that you have to create, but there's also um, the machine kit packages, the um, actual micro SD card image, the bootloader image, the uh, kernel, uh, the root file system image, all of those things. And none of them are particularly daunting in and of themselves to build. But when you look at you know how many pieces you have to actually build from scratch if you wanted to replicate this uh, from the ground up, there's quite a bit. So um, this is a list of the uh, build jobs that run on uh, uh, some of them automatically and some of them uh, by user uh, request um, on the Jenkins machine kit build server. So uh, if you grab one of the micro SD card images, these are the things that have been run that uh, created the bits and pieces that went onto that image. Uh, so this, it's not recommended that you actually use these configurations as is. Uh, the world has moved on a little even from this. Uh, this most of these were, you know, they, they might be like five, six months old, the more recent ones. I think I played with some stuff back in November last year. But um, um, things are rapidly developing. Um, you'll note here that the uh, under Linux, there's a 4.1 kernel for the Altera parts and a 4.4 kernel for the Xilinx, and I would use a 4.4 kernel today if I was uh, running on um, on the Altera. Um, but again, you know, the, the uh, it's not so much the specific versions, but you can look at these if you have a GitHub um, account. You can look at the setup for these jobs, and you can see what was being done. Um, you can see how we built, and that's uh, very helpful for rolling your own build process. Um, 
Also, uh, as I said, both Altura and Xilinx have uh, recommended uh, design flows. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more of the, well, all you do is you drop into this directory with your special command prompt and you type make, and it makes you a micro SD card image. It's like, oh, well, that's great, except it uses their exact kernel that they wanted me to use and a very specific uh, U-boot, uh, and it builds me an Angstrom Linux distribution, but I really wanted to run Debian. So uh, sometimes it can be hard to figure out how to get from the uh, vendor supplied, you know, click a button or type one command to a, I'd like to change just this piece of it. So this is how we changed all of the pieces. And, and basically each one of these pieces is not a vendor supplied um, plug and crank thing, but something that was that was done from the ground up. So uh, anyway, uh, references, the uh, first link there is a very excellent step-by-step uh, -step instruction for setting up the DE0 nano card, including uh, very helpful things like pictures of how the dip switches are supposed to be set so that it boots from the micro SD card, um, how you uh, uh, pause U boots and, and uh, assign an Ethernet physical address so that you can have networking working properly, things like that. Uh, Mesa Electronics, they are to be commended for making their source code available for the uh, FPGAs. That is, not at all a common thing to be done in industry and uh, that's I'm really um, um, amazed and impressed that they have done that um, and it's uh, it's made this work possible actually so uh, that's um, that's very helpful and kudos to them uh, also you can find as I said if you look uh, under each one of their cards they will have a um, sort of uh, like supporting files uh, that they, they have a a manual and then there's a, a, a zip file package for each one of the cards and if you download the zip file for a particular card it will include the source tree with the uh, host mode 2 um, configurations as well as uh, or the host mode 2 source code as well as many different uh, pin file configurations for that particular card um, and the various other uh, like the card package uh, for that card um, that's an excellent reference if you're looking at like, hey, we'd like to sort of roll roll our own version of this, uh, but maybe tweak some stuff, use a different FPGA, or something like that. Um, that's a great place to look for uh, a reference. Um, and then the machine kit building structure is not just the Jenkins server. Um, there's a, a documentation already online uh, as part of the machine kit project. I uh, just put a link to it there. Uh, you will find there it describes uh, the the uh, build jobs that are not running on Jenkins. Uh, we have uh, well, some of them, some of them are, but um, it's more conventional. Uh, it's uh, standard GitHub integration. So if I um, were to go and commit a change to the FPGA repository, the MK uh, SOC FPGA. Uh, repo uh, that would trigger a build of uh, the FPGA bitstreams, and uh, that then would trigger a build of the uh, package. And you can then basically apt get install the FPGA bit files and get those on uh, uh, on your system <coughs> and uh, and make use of them. So uh, anyway, that's pretty much it. Uh, I don't know if there's any detail, any questions. Um, I've been, like I said, I've been working with FPGAs for a very long time. Uh, and uh, it's really quite amazing, these new uh, SOC plus FPGA parts having the ARM processor tightly coupled to the FPGA. Uh, it's, there's a lot of uh, potential for very interesting uh, motion control applications, uh, especially if you sort of step back and look away from the CNC world at uh, uh, at the robot arm up front where uh, I could very easily see one of these SOCs with the FPGA connected via Ethernet um, and being controlled by some more intelligent, more powerful computer. Um, but the arm and the FPGA handling the sort of low level, heavy real time uh, aspect of things. But uh, anyway, uh, I've had a lot of fun working on this and hope uh, it will find some use. And yes? With the Intel acquisition of Altera, do you mm -hmm. see any changes there? 
Um, generally, no. Uh, they've rebranded their whole website, um, but uh, uh, beyond beyond that, uh, they have been telling us that uh, um, not really anything on the Altera side um, will be changing much. Um, so, any SOCs using Altera are those done by other people using, or were those created by Altera before the acquisition? Because <clears throat> At this point, it'd be an SOC with like essentially a non-Intel CPU, right? Yes, it's a yeah. There are ARM CPUs. Yeah. Um, they were uh, done by Altera. They weren't, you know, done by. Um, so you think they'll carry those on? They, yeah, they, I think Altera is already uh, our uh, Intel slash Altera has specifically said they're not going to be putting x86 in right. their FPGA. If you think they'll right. continue the ARM? If if you want a simulate, if you want a, a synthetic CPU and a PGA. Um, my, my, uh, I, I believe they will be continuing with the ARM. I don't think because until bought them, they're going to dump the ARM. No, uh, I, you know, and I, I certainly don't get that impression from uh, either the Intel people we've talked to, and we have uh, some fairly high-level contacts at Intel as well at my at my company. Um, oh, that's a good point. They are actually putting their toe in that water. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, um, they and the, you know they have also been coming out with and they've announced since um, you know some newer products with uh, uh, with ARM. Um, they're getting some uh, uh, like Cortex A53 parts and some of the larger um, FPGAs coming. Uh, a lot. I think they've got some of them now. And I, I look at the lower end stuff, but it's going it's trickling down to the lower end even. Um, but no, there's. Um, uh, and yeah, the x86 processors don't really fit well in this right. world. Uh, I have heard rumors of, uh, and they've actually done, they did a few sort of experimental um, uh, parts, but they were multi die uh, that had uh, uh, x86 processors with FPGAs. Um, those were targeted at niche markets, though, and didn't really ever catch on. Um, Part of the problem is support. Uh, the people who understand the x86 design stuff and the people who understand the FPGA design stuff were sort of in different worlds, and having it on the same, having it in the same package was is is very helpful from a hardware design standpoint. But sort of the people couldn't make it go. Uh, it's very much actually kind of like the uh, ARM plus FPGA SOC stuff when I first started with it, which is three or four years ago now. Um, it was uh, excruciatingly painful to try to create um, just what we have here, like a working micro SD card that would boot, that would run Linux, that would, you know, that wasn't like pre-canned that somebody made for you. Going out and being able to do that and find all the pieces and like program the FPGA from Linux was just, you know, awful. Now, the FPGA manager code is mainlined into the Linux kernel. Um, the Linux people are like, okay, yeah, these FPGA things, that's cool, that's a thing. Uh, we need to be able to dynamically configure our device tree and our hardware setup at runtime because the hardware can change at runtime. Um, and whether that's a FPGA hooked up to a PCI Express bus or directly connected on the same die or whatever, um, all of that stuff was not there three, four years ago. You were jumping through hoops to try to get the FPGA program, try to get Linux to know what's in the FPGA, try to get any kind of device driver to run. And now it's like, oh, just you know, build it, make a little device tree fragment, and off you go. Um, From the perspective of the ARM processor and these SOCs, what the, how does it see the FPGA part? Is it much shared memory or? Uh... Well, uh, yeah, it's an excellent question, and it um, honestly it, it depends. Um, the The systems have multiple buses internally, mm -hmm. so um, for instance, uh, and, and both the Xilinx and the um, Altera parts are very similar in this regard. Um, but in general, there are uh, there's a sort of low speed management bus uh, where the ARM core is talking to the FPGA fabric that's intended to be used. You can use these however you want, but it's generally intended to be used as an I.O. bus. So you put some hardware out there, you've got read and write registers for your you know, serial port control status, or I want to set a register bit, or blink an LED, or whatever. You know, um, it's, it's just sort of management and control. There are uh, large high-speed bus mastering 
uh, buses, one in each direction, one from the processor to the FPGA and one from the FPGA to the processor. Um, and processor to FPGA, that would be basically looking like a uh, large uh, memory, uh, just chunk of memory. And again, what you put out there in the FPGA, whether that is actually memory you can read and write from or whether that's some kind of DMA target that does something funny to the data that you wrote out there and mirrors it and sends it back encrypted. I mean, you can, you. it's up to you, but it, it's a high speed bus that the processor side writes to or reads from. And then there's another high speed bus that the FPGA side writes from and reads to. And then uh, in addition to that, there are um, sort of side entry ports into the SDRAM controller. So you've got the ARM processor system and you got a chunk of DRAM that uh, it's using for program storage and you know it's, it's runtime, it's, it's, it's the, the Linux RAM. Uh, the FPGA uh, hardware can directly access that as well. Um, and that basically doesn't go through any of the ARM system, L3, L4 uh, uh, connection fabrics. It just goes straight to the physical memory. The others, the other ports, for instance, the FPGA can bus master into the, the ARM hard processor side and do things like write to the serial port or write to the ethernet port control registers, or, I mean, n not that you would necessarily want to, but <laughs> you can, um, you know, it doesn't look any different in the FPG, you know, to the, to the hardware, whether it's the ARM core, asking to talk to the serial port or the FPGA core asking to talk to the serial port. And you can put things like soft processors out on the FPGA that would, um, you know, do something and work in concert with um, the uh, ARM core and use something like remote proc, which is um, uh, like what they're using to set up with the, the uh, PRU systems. Um, and Linux actually has a fairly generic um, kind of multi-processor support fabric. So uh, it can handle things like, uh, well, like on the X15, the, the next fancy BeagleBone that came out, there's a couple of DSP cores on there. Um, they're not gonna be running Linux, but Linux can sort of handshake and coordinate with them. And you can write code there and you can write some code on the Linux side. And then you can like, okay, yeah, I got my DSP port talking to the ethernet controller. So I told Linux not to talk to the ethernet controller. <laughs> You can do all sorts of crazy stuff, but uh, in general, it's um, and this particular design is very straightforward. There's simply, uh, uh, like I said, it looks very much like a uh, Mesa card plugged into a PCI slot, except instead of being plugged into a PCI slot, it's on the same chip, and it just uses that sort of lightweight, uh, low-speed register I/O bus, and it just looks like a bunch of I/O registers, just exactly like it does on a regular PC. So um, it's not doing <clears throat> it's not doing fancy bus mastering or anything like that. But you know it could be modified to do that. Peter's got some hooks in there where um, he's got some stuff planned for like the FPGA to be able to bus master data to the host system, but none of that's ever been I think software is the biggest hurdle for that because it's uh, uh, it becomes much more challenging on the control side when you start doing things like that. Um, although you can get much higher performance, but performance hasn't been that big of a problem, so that hasn't been a need to do that. Any other questions? Is anybody is anyone monitoring online? Does anybody have any online <clears throat> questions? So, if you have any difficulty, uh, most of uh, Mesa's uh, stuff is uh, in Xilinx like land. Uh, have you had difficulty porting the Osmo 2 stuff when you? Uh, no, actually. Um, plug and play or all, okay, so all, yeah, all of all of Mesa's cards and work that I know of runs with the uh, Xilinx parts. Yeah, he uses Xilinx mm -hmm. chips. Uh, the code, however, and he, is, and he uses the ISC thing too. And you mentioned the, you know, Lovato. Lovato, yeah. yeah. It's like you know you can't use that on uh, his stuff. There, you know, I mean, it's it's not you can't target. The parts he uses with it to use the old ASC. Parts. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So no, uh, the VHDL code. Um, oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, there might have been one or two minor changes we had to make to get it um, generic enough to compile. But no, it's um, it's very. That that's the wonderful thing about writing in VHDL. It's mm -hmm. you know it's like writing in C. Okay, mm -hmm. it's you know depending. You might have to change a little bit of something about you know. Well, I'm 
talking to a different platform or something, but by and large, it should mm -hmm. just go um, until you get to the point where you're talking to the outside world or something. Um, so no, um, basically what was required uh, was, uh, I think there might've been one or two um, like Xilinx specific kind of macro things that came from the library or, or you know, a, mm -hmm. a specific Xilinx um, um, shift register or something um, that had to get recreated as generic VHDL. I mean, it's been long enough ago and it was such a trivial task, I've, I've forgotten. Um, but I think there were one or two sort of Xilinx-isms in the VHDL code that had to get uh, pulled out and just written as generic logic. Um, okay. But uh, other than that, no. The uh, only other piece that was required is uh, both of the uh, Xilinx and the Altera um, chips use a, a, an AXI or AxiBus. Uh, and that's the standard ARM interconnect bus. Uh, and the HostMote 2 entity, um, Peter's HostMote 2, uh, has more of a sort of generic, like 68,000-ish sort of parallel ISA kind of bus, um, you know, old. Um, it's, I think it's actually, it's 32 bits, uh, I think, but um, it's even simpler than like PCI Express, mm -hmm. or the, like the PCI bus. So there's a shim layer in there that basically translates uh, AXI read and write requests into this very sort of simple address, read strobe, write strobe protocol. Um, and that again was a relatively trivial piece of Good. Um, code to uh, to craft, and uh, that's yeah, that's all it takes. And so the the entire source tree, except for the top level design, is basically identical. All the host mode two stuff. There's no sort of if defs for Xilinx or Altera or anything. It's just generic VHDL. So, but good question. So. Okay. No All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll call it a uh, wrap then. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, let's see. And I do. Let me get out of presentation mode. Uh, stop broadcast. Right.